We would like to thank all the individuals and organizations that have helped to make tonight's screening possible. All of the archive screenings in the Wilder are free thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor, and we are very grateful for their support. This screening is presented by the UCLA Film and Television Archive and Outfest as part of the Youth Outfest UCLA Legacy Project screening series and has been made possible by funding from the Andrew J. Keene Jr. Foundation. We're also grateful for, to our co-presenting partner, Film Quarterly, for its support of, this, of tonight's program. Special thanks go as well to our community partners at the UCLA LGBTQ Campus Resource Center, the UCLA Latin American Institute, and the Center for Brazilian Studies. Finally, we are tremendously thankful to internationally acclaimed writer-director Karim Anous, who is with us here tonight. I'm going to have him come up on stage for in a few minutes, but I'm going to have a round of applause right now, and then we'll come up in a second. Sorry. I forgot to rehearse that with him. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Well, we're, it's, a, it's a real honor and pleasure to have him here with us tonight. Um, so in 2005, UCLA Film and Television Archive partnered with Outfest to create the Outfest UCLA Legacy Project for LGBTQ Moving Image Preservation, which is now the largest publicly accessible collection of LGBTQ plus films in the world. Round of applause for that. That's fantastic. <laughs> this screening series is a collaborative effort between Outfest and the Archive to highlight moving image works from this collection. Tonight's print of Madame Sata does come from, uh, is a 35 millimeter subtitled print from our collection. As I mentioned also, tonight's screening is being co-presented with Film Quarterly. Published by UC Press with support from the Ford Foundation's Just Films, Film Quarterly is a film and media studies journal advancing timely and intersectional approaches to the criticism and analysis of visual culture. This 20th anniversary screening of Madame Sata coincides with Film Quarterly's new issue, which includes an essay by Bruno Gorana, uh, who offers a queer recontextualization of Madame Sata, placing it within its Brazilian global movement, or placing it within its Brazilian milieu, as well as within the new queer cinema that emerged as a global movement in the 1990s. The issue also features a conversation between Anous and film scholar Elisa Lebeau, in which Anous reflects upon his career and his new film, Mariner of the Mountains. The interview is available free online at filmquarterly.org, but you can also grab a free copy of Film Quarterly, which is out in the lobby. Please take that with you tonight and enjoy it. We're very happy uh, and thankful for Film Quarterly's support. So, born in Fortaleza, Brazil, award-winning film director, screenwriter, and visual artist Karim Anous made his feature film debut with tonight's film, Madame Sata, which premiered in the Uncertain Regards section at the Cannes Film Festival in 2002. Among his the numerous short films, documentaries, television productions, and feature films to follow, a news directed Love for Sale, I Travel Because I Have to, I Come Back Because I Love You, The Silver Cliff, and Invisible Life, which won the Uncertain Regard Award at Cannes in 2019. A three-time winner of the Best Director at the Rio International Film Festival, his most re recent feature film, the documentary Mariner of the Mountains, premiered at Cannes in 2021. Immediately following uh, the screening of Madame Sata, Karim will be joined on stage by UCLA assistant professor Alex Ongpratib Flynn for a post-screening conversation, so please stick around for that. But now it is my honor and pleasure to welcome to the Billy Wilder stage, Karim Anous. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, it's very moving to be here tonight. It's been 20 years. Um, of making this, after making this movie. There was a moment that I never thought it would be made, so it's wonderful to celebrate its long life. Um, I'm happy to share it with you also um, on film. It's a film that doesn't have a DCP yet, but you know, so I'm happy to share it with you on 35, which is exciting. I want to thank the UCLA um, Film Archive, and I want to thank Outfest and Film Quarterly. And I want to thank a lot of people who are here tonight who are sort of part of my family. Um, you know, people that are very close to me. So I'm very grateful. There is my friend Wagner, my friend Andrea, and a lot of other very close friends who are here. So I just want to thank you guys for being here and enjoy the film. And I'm lo so looking forward to talk to you afterwards. Um, after two years of the pandemic, it's really, it's so wonderful to be able to exchange with real people in a room about the impressions about, you know, what they just saw. So for us as filmmakers, it's really, really, it means a lot, and we learn a lot. So I hope you have fun. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, looking forward to sort of exchanging with you after the screening. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be here as well.
I needed those closing credits just to catch my breath. That was like fantastic. Okay, thank you for sticking around for our post-screening conversation. Our moderator tonight, Alex Ungpratib Flynn. I'm sorry, Alex Ungpratib Flynn is an assistant professor at the Department of World Arts and Cultures Dance at UCLA. Working as an eth- anthropologist and curator, Alex's practice explores the intersection of ethnographic and curatorial modes of inquiry. Researching collaborative with artists, curators, and artists, uh, with activists, curators, and artists in Brazil since 2007, Alex explores the prefigurative, prefigurative potential of art in community contexts, prompting the theorization of fields such as the production of knowledge, the, plural, the pluriversal, and the social and aesthetic dimensions of form. So um, tonight, we're, during the Q&A, when it's uh, the audience's turn, um, please wait for Alex to call on you. We'll bring a mic to you. Um, you can ask your question once you get the mic. So now, please help me welcome to the stage Alex Unpratib Flim and our special guest for tonight, Kareem Anous. Come on up. Well, incredible to watch Madame Satin, uh, and a privilege to watch it with so many of you here, and in the presence of the director, Karim Anous. And actually, uh, it's just amazing to, to kind of get this, the visual kinesthetic kind of impression. Like, uh, I have to admit that kind of watching it at home, you know, it's uh, kind of scratchy clips and so on. It's not exactly the same experience. It's wonderful to see it like this. Thank you. And I really just wanted to ask you just to start things off. Uh, this is obviously 20 years uh, to commemorate uh, Madame Satin, 2002. And looking back on the film in this way, like, you know, 20 years have passed. So many things have changed. Like, you know, how do you, I'm just really curious to hear, like, how you reflect on the film. Some of the feelings like watching it, seeing it again in obviously this context. You yeah. know, how, you, how do you feel about it? I did stay actually. I, no, I never stay on my movies. I feel like they're horrible when I finish them. I don't want to see them ever again. And like you know, and I never see what the audience. So for me, it's um, very rarely I go to see this with an audience. I see like the premiere. But today I did stay. And there's there's two things which were very touching. The, the the sort of technical conditions of showing the film tonight were incredible. Like the sound was really powerful. And because there's no DCP, every time I see this film in the last year, because there was a couple of celebrations, it's all scratched and stuff. And today was really, really beautiful. So it was it was a pleasure. And I had a lot of fun watching it, to be honest. I felt like, how did I write those dialogues? And like, what did I do to those actors? You know, like, so it was a real sense of, um, of freedom. And it's really great to do it, to see it 20 years later, and to, and to not forget that that's that's what we're here for, right? Like, it's really important to celebrate um, what we do with a lot of freedom. And so it was really moving, and I was actually laughing a lot and, and very proud of it. It's difficult to, for me to convey, actually, that, you know, I did a really bad job of it when I started off. Perhaps you could tell that. Like, this, the sheer impact, the sheer, the energy that you really drew uh, from the performances like Lazar Homos, which is just the most amazing performance. Um, but the whole cast, really, and this kind of really interesting, um, you know, this this take, 1932, Rio in Brazil, this this really alternative nucleus of a family. Yeah. And there are so many kind of interesting um, themes that are present in the film that, that uh, just seem so kind of ever more relevant today. And I don't know, was there, was there something in particular that struck you as you were watching it again? Yeah, I think there was something when I was doing it which I still feel very convinced about. And I think it was funny because there was a line in the last fiction film I made which says that family is not about blood, but it's about love. And I think that um, for me this film is about you know him and it's about you know, it's it's it is it is a portrait of of Francisco dos Santos, but it's it's really a portrait of a, of a sort of a classic, what I would say, a classic Brazilian family, um, or you know, not unfortunately not known as classic, but it is a, f- a family of like solidarity, um, very comp- complicated. You know, there is violence, there is a lot there, but I think there is ultimately, you know, a really beautiful sort of family, to, you know, portrait in this movie, and I thought enough. And I still feel like what I find it interesting to watching it today is 
these themes that you know as the years go by they kind of stay with you and they keep coming back and coming back so i was um i was pleased to see it and i was really really missing my cast because i think that this this is really a movie i mean i was i mean the other thing that was interesting for me too i didn't really know what i was doing when i was making this film to be very honest with you i worked um i worked as an assistant editor i didn't really plan to make films ever and I did some short films and I worked as an assistant editor for a long time and I only had been on a film set, I think, like for one movie, um, which was a movie I worked on in New York. So a lot of what I was doing there, I remember that the that the the GOP said, you know, you want to use a thirty five or a fifty and I'm like, What the fuck is it talking about? <laughs> and so like put it put a seventy five, you know, and, and um so there was a lot that I didn't know when I was making this film, but it didn't matter because um, I was so obsessed about making it, but also the cast really, they were so with the characters that at the end of the day, and there was this very interesting scene, which I think was the first scene that I shot, um, which is the scene where there's like chickens and, and Hannah Chion comes to visit him. And in that scene, um, it was very tricky because they couldn't keep their marks and they didn't know what marks were. It was the first time they were, I mean, Lazo had made one movie before, but or maybe a couple movies before, but not as a protagonist and the other character. So they couldn't keep anything together, but they could keep, it, it, was, like a, it was like a fever dream, you know, what they were doing. There was a, there was a sense of really only those characters. And, and I thought, and so we couldn't keep the focus, we couldn't keep the marks, the director's line was crossed all the time. And when I went to the editing room, I actually realized that this is what the film needed to, to be. You know, I needed to embrace my ignorance and also to embrace the passion I had for those characters. And I think um, this is what was really great to, to see again. I mean, I wish I had, I wish I knew a little less than I know today, actually, when I see this film. And I remember how there was something which was really bowing to the, to the actors and to what they proposed, you know, as, as they're reading for the characters. So it's, yeah, I mean, I should actually be dedicating this even into Lazarus and to the cast, to be honest, you know, so. Um, they were really, really, um, yeah, they were really free throughout. I think I've already spoken too much, so perhaps we could have some questions from the floor. Like, yeah, I'm very uh, curious. Do Don't be shy. A... Yes, question here, down at the front. Just one second, wait for the microphone. Do you need a microphone? Karim, uh, I think you know how much I love you, right? Like, to me, he is the poet is not a director, he's a poet, you know? And that's why you don't need to know how to make a film because your poetry always comes through. But what struck me uh, this time watching this film, I think my hundredth time, but I never seen it in the theater, is how relevant it is in the Brazil times at the moment that we're living in, you know? Cause we're going through a very horrible political time. And uh, it's always stunning to me how your films are relevant you know, like speaking about race with such truth. So I, as you saw that, as you said that you saw this film again and it made you feel good. How do you feel that you would do this if you did it now, in today's uh -huh. age? Mm -hmm. Well, I think if I had the age I had and I would do it now, probably it wouldn't happen. Like the first thing, maybe not in this format, it would happen in a more more radical way of manufacturing it. But I don't know. I don't know how I would do it. I am. Um, I probably would just, I guess I wouldn't do the same, right? Because it's 20 years later and I've made so much stuff in between. And I think I do have a bit of a knowledge of what I do. So I probably shouldn't make it today. I think because I think it's something, you know, I'm, I'm always thinking of, 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 of cinema and storytelling and characters. I think it's, it's so okay, maybe I, I think I, I do know how I make it. I think it's always about, um, sort of following these things of the characters, you know, I think the colors, the way you shoot the light, I mean, for me, it's always about sort of following character and understanding character and translating character. So um, I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't, I would make the same, but I think it would be very like this one, but I think there's something really different when I made this movie than now. I mean, there was a lot of hope when I made this film. This film was made in 2002, and I think you remember what happened in 2002. It was the first time that Lula was elected, and I think this film really translates 
a sense of, I think it was shot in 2001 and it was released in 2002, so there was a real sense, it was finished in 2002. So there's a real sense of hope and of, you know, liberation and of, you know, explosion. And I think, um, you know, no, no need to go further here, but, you know, it's sort of the opposite of what we're living in that country today. So I think I would make it today. I think it's important to make it, no matter, you know, maybe I would make it with my phone, but I think it would need to, to be made. But I don't think I would, that freedom, I don't think I would have it now. I think I have a different kind of freedom. That freedom is a freedom that's very specific of a certain moment in time, I think. I'm not sure if I answered that question with clarity, not even for myself, but um, yeah. Do we have another question from the floor? I'm very curious about people who haven't seen this before. Like, it would be really interesting to know. Good. Hello. Okay. Hi. Good evening. I'm from Colombia. I grew up devouring Brazilian culture. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, as an old photographer of film in black and white in dark rooms, I think it's a, like she said, it's a work of poetry. We work in theater, and it's uh, each frame, uh -huh. it's a piece of theater. The f the the respect for the photography and the chiaroscuro, it's almost like Caravaggio. It's absolutely beautiful. Like they said, it's so relevant and beautiful, and it's just so Thank alive. You. They're so alive. And when we work in cinematography today, there's so much technical stuff and so much attention to, oh, his, his face is not, is not lit yeah. enough. There's not, not enough chiaroscuro. There's not enough mystery. Mm. And sometimes we lose the actors and their energy in all these remakes and retakes and the perfect lighting. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, the story is a bit lost in that... Um, like she said, the poetry of it, the rawness, the, the human power of it. So I just want to congratulate you. Well, From thank here you. to infinity, it's absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. I think there's a question there, and a question there. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, the colors are so beautiful. It was just a, like, I felt like it was it was one probably one of the most um like intense like films I've seen in terms of just like the ebb and flow of emotion that you kind of go through um you're kind of being rocked back and forth between this like tumultuous like tension and love that I feel like we all like recognize to different degrees um my main question though was that all that footage at the end is that like real like foot like uh, footage yeah. or because we made it to that point that I don't know, like, it, yeah. it, it, cause it was, it was so texturally and stuff. It was different yeah. from the initial perform, the last performance and yeah. like, but it all kept the same energy and, it all, and you know, uh, it was magnificent. But I wasn't sure. So I was like, yeah, it's not, it's not archival. It's funny because we shot, I think it was the scene that had the biggest number of extras in the whole film. And there was a lot of, you know, people, men dressed as women and, you know, drag queens. It was a mess, like, in this theater. It was a really beautiful mess in this theater in Rio. And, um, and it was really hard for me to shoot. I felt like I wasn't capturing it. And I remember it was a night shoot. And so I got a friend who brought a Super 8 camera because I was feeling like what I was going to do on 35... I would just, I'll tell you about the 35 millimeter story in a minute, but I was feeling like what I was going to do with the sort of format of the film was not going to do justice to the, to the sort of explosion of life that there was in that place. So I said, you know what, I'm going to cover myself. I'm going to shoot this on Super 8 as well. I don't, know, I don't remember if I shot it or someone helped me shoot it. But so we had two different formats. We had 35 and Super 8. So that much is interesting because it's, I had that question once before. So it's not it's not archival, but it is a much more intimate way of shooting that situation, which was super great. And it wasn't done to look like archival, but it was just I just thought that was the best way to capture that scene, you know, and the texture and the energy and, and what was there. Uh, so yeah, it was a different format, but it wasn't thought. I mean, I did it as a B plan, you know, but I kind of knew that that was going to be what I was going to use. And um. The other funny thing about this film is nobody nobody thought I could do it. So at the end, um, 
we got this funny contract with one of the distrib the producers that we could not shoot this film on 16 because it was too amateur, you know, that I had to shoot on 35. And I've always never wanted to do this on 35, you know, because I thought 35 was was not the right format for this. There was a lot of definition there. So I started, to, a lot of what this film was about was destroying what I was given. So I had to shoot in 35. So, okay, so I'm going to do 35, but I'm going to do a bleach bypass on the, ne on the negative. <clears throat> and it was very dangerous. It's a format where you don't put the fixator on the, on the, on the image. So it was very chemi chemically quite dangerous to do it in a lab that never had done it before, maybe that had done it once. But I kind of like the kick of it, you know, like I like the thrill of like not knowing what was going to happen the next day and how it would look. Um, there was one other thing which was very crazy. I could not, I was not allowed to do more than two or three takes per shot because of the amount of negative. In the beginning it was very hard, but at the same time, I think it's like every film has becomes a beast of its own. So I think a lot of those things were very they were just part of what this film should have been, really, at the end. Um, and I think, to answer your question, uh, too, I think it was the last, it was the last days of the shoot. Like, I think I had spent almost the negative I needed and that I could spend, so there was not a lot of cans left. So the Super 8 was also a way to do it that I could um, just have more footage. So it was almost like a vengeance, you know, you don't let me do this on 16, so I'll do it on Super 8, but at least the last scene, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you had a question there. I appreciate how, as a director, you actually pull us into the film. And talking about the energy of the actors, was it intentional on your part to have it so intimate and bring us in? Because yeah. in a lot of the scenes, the energy just goes and it seems like you just let it go. You stood there as close as you could to be more intimate to the scene. It was so I never worked with actors before. The first, this is the first time. I mean, I did short films, but they're quite experimental. They were actors, but this one was the first one that I needed to sort of take control of things and understand what performances were. And I was very lucky to work with an actor who helped me prepare the, act, the actors, the cast. But more than anything, what I was really interested here is that this is a guy who changed his name many times. There was the first question about this film, which was, should this be a documentary, right? I always ask myself, like when I'm looking at a subject, you know, how is the best way to go for it? You know, is it is it an essay? What is it? And I thought of making a documentary because I spent years researching about his life. I mean, I know I went to all the police archives in Rio. I mean, I you know, I had I was really prepared when I started shooting. Um, but you know, the other thing that was very clear to me, this is, a, so the moment I decided to do a fiction was because he was fictionalizing his life all the time. You know, like, so he was always, he, every time that he was arrested, he changed his name because then he would like to be a first time offender. So he would get less time in jail. He's very, you know, brilliant man, obviously. Um, and so I thought there was also this very interesting way of performer, you know, this, this, of performing oneself. And um, to escape, to reinvent oneself, and I think the first thing that I decided to do when I had this friend that was helping me prepare the cast was, let's just explore this and make this OTT. This needs to be over the top. Like his life was over the top, the call was over the top. So there was no way, the only thing you couldn't be is afraid. And um, and I look at the performances today. I I don't know if I I don't know if I had I would have the courage to do that today. To be honest with you, because that was very free. Like I was remember in in all the scenes we rehearsed all the scenes as if we're doing a play. You know, so we read we read the script and then we did rehearsals um, on a studio and then we did rehearsals on a um, on location with costumes, which was really really wonderful. And so a lot of the scenes they completely changed because of the life they brought, because of the way that they read the scenes. So for example, the scene when they're doing coke in the bathroom, it was a very calm, I mean, it's not calm, you know, like, because the guys are doing coke in the bathroom, but like, it was a more quiet scene. But you know, when they rehearsed, I was tweaking them to go in different directions and, and finding, you know, the color of it. So I think it was, um, it was done in a way that um, it was never supposed to be um, naturalist. It was always supposed to have an artificiality to it, and, and you know, and to be theatrical in the sense of artificial, really, of constructed. Um, and I think um, 
when you ask me what I would do today, I mean, I don't know. Well, maybe I would, but it's the kind of things that you know you 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 think three times before you do it. But I think it would not have been fair to have done it otherwise. It's like the colors that as somebody mentioned here, the colors. Um, it was not because I thought it was beautiful to do a bleach bypass um, f solution, which was to make it very contrast. The character is very contrasted, so I thought it was just coherent to make it as as it is um, made. Um, and I also, the cast was fantastic because there was something about a mix between very well-known actors and seasoned actors, like the guy who's the owner of the bar is one of the wonderful, most wonderful Brazilian actors. He's, he's not with us anymore, but, and the woman who plays, um, who plays Vitória is also a wonderful, incredible theater actor. And then, you know, um, Renatinho was his first movie. The woman who plays Marcelle Laurita, is one of my most beautiful actors of all time. She's a woman who was really incredible. So there was this mix, and I think it was um, tricky because there was like different notes. How do you compose something with that? So I just sort of pushed the volume up, and I think they all went there, and that's where they met. So I think it was, um, but it was a deliberate decision to to just go, you know, and, and the, the fight scenes are very badly done. And I had no idea how to do them, but I think that the, the fact that they are sort of done in almost punk way kind of um, was what I could do. There, I know there's a question here, but if I could just quickly ask you something which struck me. Um, you know, we, we were talking about the lights and the color, but also there was something about the sound design that really struck me. Oh, yeah. Me. So, like, uh, in all the kind of intimate moments, yeah. There's always background. There's always yeah, noise, yeah, yeah. and you know anyone who's lived in Brazil or been to Brazil, yeah. you know, what, after living in Brazil for a long time, I came back to Europe, and I was like, Christ, it's quiet here. Like, where's all the yeah, noise? This yeah, is freaking yeah. me out. Like, at night time, it's yeah. quiet. <laughs> what? This is so weird. Where's the noise? <laughs> and I was like, watching that, I was like, you know, it this is, is really is. particular yeah. to Brazil. Yeah. That kind of in those in intimate moments and that collapsing of personal space because you're always aware of people and sociality yeah. all around you. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you're a, a filmmaker who's, who's lived and worked, you know, across the world, but. You know, how much of Brazil is in this film? And why is think, Brazil important? I film? think all of it. I think this film was made... So the sound, yeah, right? So the sound, it was really wonderful. I mixed this movie with... Uh, I have, I was very lucky to do Post in France. And I'm saying lucky because I mixed this movie with a guy who was totally... I had a wonderful sound designer and, and a mixer who was just brilliant. And he was... He, he really embraced... I remember like when we were mixing... The, the, the sort of beads when like hitting his chest and stuff. I say, just pump it up. And he's like, yes. So he was like really like on the same trip that we were. But the other thing besides this funny story was that um, I think I made this film because I was living abroad for about 10 years. So I think, no, yeah, I left Brazil in 1988. I was living in New York and I made this film in 2001. So I start, so it, this film is really a way for me to understand a country that I didn't really understand and also, I come from a very different place. I come from the Northeast. It has nothing to do with Rio de Janeiro. But for me, the, the image of Brazil that one would negotiate when you are not in Brazil is the image of, you know, of, of Rio. And so I studied a lot about Rio in the time. And what was really fascinating was that Rio was the place where, after the abolition of slavery in 1880, in 1888, there was a huge migration, you know, of people that um, had been freed. And, and they went there, and it was this really, and there was a, it was a harbor. It was like, it was this really interesting place, you know, of of things mixing. And it was a very musical place, you know. There was there was music, and there was sound, and there was like a kind of very porous, you know, world where, where sound traveled. And for me, it was very important to construct um, the world off screen. Like I think, not 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 obviously, not what you see is not what you hear. But I think here was really important for me to sort of construct this pulsating place, you know, that it's always busy and there's always music somewhere. Sometimes it's not music, it's just percussion. And you hear what people, you know, and I think it was also a way to to, to translate class. I think that the way that um, it is also a way to translate class, you know. So for me it was, all of this was um, a, a really big learning experience about the history that I wasn't told about you know a community that I didn't know about a culture like the, I did a lot of this and a lot of what I found again I said this tonight but it wasn't on history books it was 
on a on a newspaper called it was called Anoite, called the Night, which is a newspaper that covered all crime in Rio. And I went to all the archives of that newspaper because that's the only place that you had anything about this this world, you know. And then um, the police archives were fantastic because all that that beginning of the film when he is being told when you know this this voiceover of him, it's not. I didn't write. I mean, I could never write that. You know, that's brilliant, and it's a, a literal transcription of a police archive. That described him, but for me it was a for me making this film was really a huge learning experience to understand, you know, what what is that part of the country, how it became what it became, its richness at a moment which was a really interesting moment. It's a moment of liberation, you know. This is this is twenty yet yeah, a bit more than you know, and he is a, you know, he he fled and he comes from where, not where I come from but close. And he fled to Rio, um, so he's a living example of of that sort of vortex that Rio became at that time. Yeah, you, you had a question down here at the front. Yes. Uh, my question is actually around the needle drops. Um, is there on one? The needle drops, the songs. Uh, your film is extremely musical, and yeah. I think a lot of the songs help carry the narrative forward. So I wanted to ask if you had some these songs in mind when you were writing the script or if they kind of came to you afterwards? I did, interesting also, because when I was saying about this newspaper and I was saying about the police archives, the other source of history that one does have from that moment is the lyrics of these songs. You know, that's what poetry, that's how poetry got published. And poetry that was produced by you know a strata of society that was completely invisible. But that, you know, it's like pop culture, right? Like it's pop music. So it was a very, so I did a lot of research on lyrics and um, it was very, yeah, we did we did a choice, uh, a very clear choice of um, the songs, where they were and what did he perform. And there is a biography of, um, there's a biography of Madame Satan that was published in the 70s and a lot of the stuff that's there, he, he had mentioned. Uh, of the song. So it was not only songs that I like, but also things that I think were dear to him. It is an incredible soundtrack. <laughs> it is a musical in a way, right? When I look at it. So it is, yeah, you want it to be like a like a pop star, you know? It's like it's like Bowie on something, you know? <laughs> anyway, it's much more interesting than Bowie, actually. But but it is this guy who is a performer, you know, and he wanted to sing and he wanted to, you know, play different roles and so on. So. Just, there is actually quite a lot of Bowie in your work, though, isn't there? Like there's a bit, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just as a swerve. <laughs> um, yes, question up here. On Sylvester. Um, so I had a question. I mean, the film is so visually striking and powerful and unique. I want to talk about the narrative structure, though, and the the storyline. You you talk about the amount of research that you did. Yeah. I feel like a more traditional biopic would have raced through everything you have actually as the the, the, the you know your whole story to get to the yeah, carnival to yeah. get to the visual of the carnival yeah. you build to it in a way, um, and I, I feel like there's a that that choice is somehow connected also the framing of the police you know um, mm. the, the mugshots because there's a there's a the framing is about the imposition mm. of meaning. The imposition of identity and then the struggle to yeah, be free to from undo that. it. Yeah. Can you talk about that? The framing. Yes, of the police, absolutely. Uh, and then also just why you chose to focus on this part, the emergence of. Yeah, that's a great question. Listen, um, as I said before, it took me about eight to nine years to make this movie, so there was a lot of thinking and a lot of um, processing to do. But one thing that was really hard was. Yeah, the traps of a biopic, you know, and I don't believe, I, I believe in bio books, but I don't think cinema is at all the place to do biographies, you know, like it's, it should be about a certain moment in time. And it was very hard to choose that moment. Um, so I'll say three things. I did shoot his, um, his childhood, but I didn't use it. It didn't make sense to use it. And I think ultimately the script is, um, the way that I thought of the script was what, I mean, really what interests me in this character is rage. I'm really interested in rage as a transformative force, a political transformative you know, force. And, um, and it, it was not until I understood that, that the script, so the script had like, I don't know, 16, 18 versions and it was the beginning. So it was like, how do you call this in English from, from birth to, to, isn't there like a way that you say, 
birth to grave, right? The, yeah. So it was it was a bit like that. And then I started to narrow it down, narrow it down. And so there were clear choices. Okay, being very open here, I don't think I don't think the script of this movie is it is it is a mess. And it is a mess um, because I didn't know what exactly I was writing, but I think that the reason the film works is because of, of oops, oops. I have a contact lens problem. We have a contact lens problem. <laughs> That's why the film is a bit out of focus. It's not, it's not a joke, it's true. <laughs> it's true. I don't see without lenses, so I felt it was interesting to shoot out of focus. Um, but this script, right? So yeah, I think this script is truly. It's. I was looking at it tonight, and I was just thinking, wow, this is not. They're not fighting, you know. We're not shouting, you know. Like, where is the story moving? So I don't think it's a script that's constructed um, classically, and I think it was because of the deconstructing of it throughout the process. Um, and I think a lot of, as in many, as in, as in, I think in almost every film I've made so far, um, it, it is in the editing. You know, so I think we really found. So I don't think there's a structure, like the, I don't think I don't think you can identify like plot point one, like a classic structure, right? I don't think you can identify that. It's almost like it's, I don't know how to say it, but it's this force of life, which is, I mean, this film resides ninety nine percent on Lazaro. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, it is it is the force that's there that makes the film exist, and so I got away with it. Because I think that there is such an explosion of life on his performance that then I got away with story. But then there's a minimum of story that you have. So yes, so the, the framing was how do you undo everything I read about this man was um, pathologizing, it was criminalizing him, it was constantly trying to erase him and to, to kill him. So I think for me it was the conceptually speaking, it was understanding that rage was his motor, and I was very, in a, you know, the other thing too that I think it's important to say here, I lived in this country for many years and in New York, uh, in a, you know, it was very different New York than it was now, but it was the first time, and I think because of the civil rights movement and the friends I had, it was the first time that I understood what confrontation was. I think Brazil is a country that is very much avoids in confrontation at all costs. And I think what I really was, really, really high on this guy was because I think he was like, he was confronting very, very, you know, frontally what he, the fact that, you know, it, it's very clear what he says in the movie. There's a scene for me which is very emblematic, what he says, you know, it's, it's. I think I was born wrong, you know, and that's why I'm so, you know, that's why I have so much rage and I need to get it out and I need to confront it. So I think everything was in the editing room, there was all these great scenes, but when you put them together, it didn't really, it didn't really gel. So, but, but I think at the moment I understood that, that the emotional line of the story is about, you know, him trying to break through and say, you know, if you can't be here, why can't I? Why, why, why I can't? You know, like the moment he goes into that club for me, and and that is what's, that is what's at every, that's what's happening at every scene. But I and and and, and also it's this effort. I don't know. It's the the word is like it's a little tacky. It's like to humanize him, but to actually to to render homage to his complexity and to his intelligence and to his talent by that framing. But that's something that was not at all on the script. Um, it was something that happened after I shot. I shot that scene very intuitively. That's like you know, it's a white sheet, and he's in front of it. Um, and then I, I wrote, you know, and I didn't write as I told you, but I brought the voiceover later. So I think it's interesting also how much you can get away. And I also think that it could not be a minute longer, you know, because there's a moment that it does get repetitive. And I think it's the brilliance of his performance that doesn't allow it to fall apart. I mean, I'm being a bit cruel with the film now, but, you know, it's, it is, it, I'm saying this because I think, it was it was also very interesting to give up on the idea of bio, bio, of biopic. Biopic is just I never saw one that I actually like because I think it's not the medium for it. And it was very interesting because I fought so much to fight to shoot his childhood, and at the end it was also for me an exercise as a filmmaker. It didn't work, you know. The things that you shoot, and and I think it's important. It was important, you know. I'm, the producers would kill me to hear this, but because it was a lot of money to travel to the Northeast and spend four days shooting, but I needed, to, you know, maybe that's something I wouldn't do now, you know, like I wouldn't do that. 
I would be a bit more rigorous about like, but I actually made their life hell because I said, we need the childhood, we need to go there. So I went and shot, but I think the biggest lesson is like, it didn't, it didn't, really, it didn't really make sense. So it was a script that was very much written and the woman who edited the movie is a, is a friend, a very close friend who had been editing all my shorts. And um, so we're very, very close and it sort of understood, you know, what it took. But, um, but yeah, story-wise, I think it's full of flaws and I don't think that causality doesn't really work in this film, you know. So it's more an accumulation of explosions, I would say, that defines the storyline. Um, and again, I think I got away with it because you have such a brilliant performance that um, then there we go. But but and, and maybe that would be the mistake of making it today because I think I probably would want to package it in a way that it's clear and the story is clear. You know, that's how to unlearn that is also something that's quite difficult. Do we have uh, perhaps another question or a comment? Yeah. I um, just want to say I'm just blown away by the film. Just absolutely amazing. Good. So you're just... <laughs> I mean, I, <laughs> I hate to use Shakespeare, but you, like, you're going to be revered for a long time. <laughs> so my, my question is, um, how is it received in Brazil? Yeah. At that time and then today. Yeah. And then I, I know the story of Mariel Franco a yeah. little bit. I don't know if this is the venue to talk about her yeah. and what's going on today, but I'm kind of curious about her story and I want to learn more about, you know, this the context and yeah. her, her life and so on. So thank you. Um, it was received. It was, rec it was very strange because this movie played, it opened in Cannes and it was, it was the junior movie. Like the senior movie was city of God, you know, it was like, City of God, and then I was like, the sidetrack. And um, and I say this very openly, I was very shocked when I got, I so I, I was super excited, you know, in my tuxedo and all that, you know, like going to Cannes. And so I remember going home to kind of get dressed up, you know, and put my bow tie and get ready to go to the screening. And then I, I had like a ticket, and in the ticket it said, this film can hurt the sensibility of viewers, blah, 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 and it's like, it, but then, you know, but on the other on the other big room was like City of God with like thousands of people being killed, you know, like not thousands but like hundreds. So I, and, but they also had the same sticker, and I'm just trying to figure out, oh wow, like you know, love is dangerous, you know, like why is this happening here? But okay, no, I'm not silly. I knew it would have something like that, but not to that extent. So that was the first sort of kick I had, and I said, okay. And I actually saw it today again. There's a lot of sex in this film, right? I didn't know like there was a lot of sex, and I. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I thought there was a little bit of sex, but I didn't know there was a lot of sex. You know, there's a lot of fun as well. You know, sex in the sense of fun, and um, and so I had this sort of red flag in Cannes. And then when I when I went to Brazil, this is what happened. It was also a different time. It was a very different time. I mean, if we want to talk about Brazil, we can spend hours, and we don't have that time. But you know, it's the country that holds the biggest rate of religious conversion is Brazil today. Like, so it's becoming a highly conservative place. But at the time, what was interesting, and I think this is how I got away with it, obviously, like, you know, also in the premiere and also in the other premieres, you know, people left. Today, I think, was the first day that people didn't leave. But people did leave, you know, and every screening, and I say I don't go to watch my movies, but I went to the screening, and I didn't sit there watching it, but I was, like, just outside seeing what's happening. So there was people leaving. There was about 10%, 15% of the audiences that went in and they left. But at the same time, I think the reason I got away with it is that it, it, it is a real-life character. So I think that the fact that there was a real-life character, there also there was a real thirst for like an Afro-Brazilian character. There were no movies, you know. There was a movie made about this guy in 1973. There was a couple of movies made in the 70s, but then there was nothing. So I think there was a real hunger for it. Uh, and I think, I really think it's because also he was, um, he was, he, it, this is a, it's not a true story, but it's inspired on a true story. So it, that allow, and, and he's not known in the country, but the name is so, it's fascinating, Madam Satan, you know, like, oh, what is this? So people kind of knew about him. It was a very sort of underground figure, but I think that um, 
All this to say that despite of this trauma I had in Khan, it was really well received. It was very well, it was beautifully embraced. Um, and I think it's one of the movies that I've made that has the biggest number of viewers, really. And uh, But like what would happen today? I don't know, it's very complex. You know, today, first of all, for those who go to cinemas are really bridge people. So, you know, it's a really sort of deluxe experience. So I think it's such a different moment. And also, you know, it's a different country, it's a different time in the world, so it's, um, yeah, I think it, I was just very um, lucky to make it. You know, it's not lucky, but I think it, there was a synergy there that was very important when it was made and what it meant. Perhaps we have time for one last question. Would anyone like to, yeah. Yes, please. You mentioned uh, a film in 1973. Was that Black Orpheus? No. Because I was thinking about Black yeah. Orpheus a lot, although that was much yeah. more in the streets. Yeah, no, I think Black Orpheus is from the 50s. Ah. 1956, I think. And it's, uh, it's interesting because it's such an emblematic film, but it's not a Brazilian film. Ah. It's a French film. It, it's a it's film by, made by a French director. I was made management in a movie called 19, It's called Rainha Diaba, the, the the Bandit Queen, or something like this, which is also a movie that's based on um, the same character. Really interesting, beautiful, wild 1970s uh, movie. This is this is this is for kids compared to what <laughs> <laughs> to what the 1973 was. It was like it was great. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's a different kind of rock and roll, I mean, different kind of samba here. So it was, you know, but it it was it's a movie called uh, Bandit Queen, and I think I've never had a double bill. I think it would be really great to do a double bill um, with this movie because I think it's also a movie that needs to be seen and it needs to be exposed and celebrated. Well, I think we've kind of come to the end of the time we've got. Um, you know, it's been wonderful to be here with you. As Kareem said, like in person, it's so wonderful to have this kind of convivial experience once again. Yeah. And so yeah. I'd just like to say thank you yeah. to the UCLA Film Archive for organizing the event and to Karim Anous for being here with us tonight. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.